it's worth noting, guys, the dynamics of the dam here, really interesting. You've got fairly vertical front face, and then the back end of the dam tapers back down, and they'll push sediment and stones, anything they can get really into the back of that. New patterns of extreme weather are becoming ever more common, with storms and heat waves leading to floods and droughts caused by a mixture of climate change and the industrialization of our landscapes. Much of the conversations on how to combat these challenges focus on man-made solutions and short-term quick fixes. But what if there was a way to work with nature to get to the source of the problem? I've come to Devon to meet the conservationists joining forces with some of nature's most effective engineers to restore critical wetland habitats. Wetlands are waterlogged environments rich in biodiversity. The UK has lost 90% of these habitats over the last 100 years or so, leading to a drastic decline in wildlife and making the country more vulnerable to the effects of extreme conditions. Landowner Derek Gow has seen this impact firsthand. What we've done is we've created a landscape that is now provoking us with extreme actions. So the flooding comes because there's no room for the water anymore. The big sponges that were there are not there to absorb it. So what happens is the water runs off the flattened fields straight down into the small water courses, from the small water courses to the big water courses, until you have a roaring torrent that hits infrastructure, buildings, people's homes, cars, and smashes them away complete. The fundamental problem is we need to hold more water on the land. Derek is an ex-farmer turned rewilding pioneer. Back in 2012, he employed the services of a long-lost inhabitant of these parts to help with water management on his land. We have a beaver dam down here, and the beavers have created a permanent water body. And this is one that's visible. So where there would have been no water before, there's water all the time. When the dams are new and fresh and made from sticks and rocks, they're very visible and very obvious. But because beavers use a lot of aquatic plant roots, if you leave them in place long enough, then the plant roots consolidate the structure and what you get is a bank going across, and that's what this now is. So we find these little white sticks um, floating in the dam. They're the first thing you look for because they tell you that the activity is current. And you can see that there's a the wee patch oh, yeah. on, that, on an oak tree there where they've just taken the back up. But I mean, generally, they could fell a tree like that, but that would be a fairly um, you know, substantial commitment and they're not generally going to bother. It's principally willow, aspen, alders and you can see here that what they've done is when it gets to any substantial size is they go around it taking out chips. In the end you end up with this pencil sharpened shape and then boom the tree comes down and then they go up and down the sides taking off the side branches because what they're looking for is this fine nutritious bark here um, and then all the leaves at the top, and that's why they're trying to fail the tree. So an outsider might look upon this scene and say, well, that's quite destructive for nature, isn't it? Yes, but look at what's growing. Those trees yep. have all been felled by the beavers, or that's been felled by the beavers. These trees have a 40 million year old relationship with this animal, and when they're felled, they regenerate. This tree is entirely in tune. It's partner the beaver, and they understand each other well. This is not destruction, this is gardening. Droughts and floods aren't the only thing on Derek's mind. Britain has lost nearly half of its biodiversity since the Industrial Revolution, and experts warn that continued loss will lead to an ecological meltdown. But what's this got to do with beavers? So we take this scene, this clearing is all entirely created by beavers. So at one point in time, it would have been dark and shady. There would be no understory of fruit and pollen, um, which butterflies, insects, small mammals, birds, a whole variety of other creatures require. You would have had a simple understory without the fallen wood, and under the fallen wood you have reptiles, you have other small mam mammals making their burrows and hiding from predators. This area is open and sunny, and that's why the other plants and herbs are growing here. Um, so the difference is huge and profound. No beavers, dark, shady, no vegetation at all. The beavers open up the environment, and you have an environment that opens up to sunlight and all the other plants grow. Historically, the beaver would have been carrying out these gardening duties across the UK, 
until it was hunted to extinction in the 16th century. This was for both its super soft fur, meat and castorium, a secretion used in medicines. Derek's reintroductions can teach us much about how these ecological services have been missed. What are the benefits, say, in this little micro-ecosystem we've got here? Well, the benefits in this micro-ecosystem here are if you're a big animal, you can come to drink. Mm -hmm. If you're an aquatic animal, like an otter, mm -hmm. you can come right the way up this water body and where there would be no water without the beaver dams, you can go over the dams and hunt in the depths beneath. Mm -hmm. If you're an amphibian, um, you can lay your clumps of spawn. Um, if you're a damselfly, you have the correct plants um, for laying your eggs on, your larvae can go in there and predate on the amphibians. And everything starts to work in synchrony with that. You know, in the trees, you have um, woodpeckers boring holes in the dead trees, and then willow tits, which are a nationally endangered species, coming back this year to nest in those holes and to rear their broods too. So everything in its, its tiny detail revolves around the beaver. After witnessing the positive impact of the beaver's activities on his land, Derek has long been campaigning to have beavers reintroduced to the wider landscape. Next to humans and elephants, the beaver is the third most impactful mammal on other life forms in, on this planet. Unfortunately, not everybody shared in Derek's enthusiasm, with resistance from concerned farmers making his vision seem impossible. Then in 2014, the Devon Wildlife Trust started to receive curious phone calls. Now we've heard about the odd beaver here and there and we get on all sorts of interesting calls in Devon Wildlife Trust about we've seen this and we've seen that. So there was a certain... Um, the beast of Bodmin. Yeah, the beast of Bodmin. <laughs> yeah. There were certain dubious um, elements to it. But in 20, um, 2014, um, there was footage released of a beaver pair, an adult pair, uh, some juveniles and their kits. And we had confirmation that on the River Otter um, were breeding. Now we don't really know the origins of that population. And that was kind of the, the, the beginnings of, of the trial. So there was big public meetings in Otterie St. Marriage, a town lower down the otter catchment. And there was a lot of discussion about, you know, we want to keep our beavers and we love our beavers and, and, and we, uh, we want them in our landscape. It was then decided the beavers could stay alongside five additional adult pairs. This was part of a five-year trial to monitor the impacts to a lowland, intensive agricultural setting. One pair was released to this site in 2016. The lodge through, is that lodge, the lodge through there? Yeah, so the lodge is on the island in the middle of the pond. Matt Holden, the Devon Wildlife Trust Beaver Project lead, keeps a close eye on what the beavers get up to here. This is really cool actually. So they've more recently popped a dam in on the main river just down here. They being the beavers. They being the beavers, yeah. 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 <laughs> and um, as you can see, that backs up quite a lot of still water yeah. here. And you wouldn't really expect beavers to dam in rivers like that. Because it's slightly too big? It's slightly too big, it's slightly too powerful. Um, and it's really quite an impressive dam now. Yes. I think they've probably added about a foot to it since I saw it last. So it's getting bigger and bigger. Um, yeah, well, they'll add to it and maintain it as long as they possibly can, really. Can we go down? Yeah, not yeah, really. Can. Yeah, so it's, it's worth noting, guys, the dynamics of the dam here, really interesting. You've got a fairly vertical front face, and then the back edge of the dam, we can't really see it, but tapers back down, and they'll push sediment and, and um, stones, anything they can get really into the back of that. So the thickest part of the dam is where the highest force of the water is. So they can, they can be really stable structures. So there's often this fear of what happens when this blows out, but usually they dis disintegrate gradually over time. So parts will come off the top and around the side, and then slowly over a winter, they'll disintegrate. Um, and you can see, you get lovely features like these deep pools in the lead into the dam, and then these lovely shallow riffles on the lead out. So you get these interesting habitats develop. Some really good for certain types of animals and spawning fish. Uh, some are better for adult fish and, and, and different types of uh, macroinvertebrates. So what we see is that typically these are delivering a really good flow attenuation benefit. So they reduce flow, flood peaks and they can improve base flows. So there's some really interesting science around how they could work as a natural flood management tool. A pair of beavers released on this East Devon River in 2016 have been busy creating a dynamic wetland environment. Further to the unexpected beaver dam in the main river, 
Matt Holden, the Devon Wildlife Trust Beaver Project lead, and his team were also pleasantly surprised to discover the network of canals across the neighbouring field. This is really exciting because it's all new to me. I mean, they'd started up here a couple of weeks ago, but most of this looks like it's happened in the last week. And there's canals out all the way across parts of this field now. So we'll try and find some more around the back there, but this is amazing, yeah. <laughs> Every time you come to site, something new happens. Yeah, they're working hard. Yeah, really hard. These tunnels just turning up everywhere. So you see how they've already started to build a bit of a, a channel here. They've dug out here because they prefer staying in the water as they're moving, is that Yeah, why? yeah, okay. so water for them is all about safety. Yeah. Um, so because they're co-evolved with, you know, things like wolves and bears in, yeah. in other parts of Europe, yeah. It's all about giving them um, that, that access to a, a safety channel, if you like, and then they can be relatively discreet at swimming off. I don't know if you've ever seen them out of water, but they're fairly cumbersome, bulky things. Yes. Um, but in water, they can be uh, much more serene. Oh, right. So, okay, so that's what, and then this whole ecosystem built up around it. Yeah, yeah. So obviously you're increasing the kind of amount of wetland habitat. So here they're creating these lateral channels, which provide all sorts of habitat for um, macroinvertebrates, so freshwater macroinvertebrates like damsel and dragonfly larvae, and also really important habitat for, for water vole. The once common water vole is the UK's fastest declining mammal, disappearing from 70% of known sites over a seven year study. Like many of the native species, habitat loss, pollution, and environmental degradation are the cause for the water vole's now endangered status. So this is where the water vole are really doing really well. And you've got these little 45 degree cut uh, signs, and this is called a feeding station. So they'll sit in there, nibble away, and then they're close to the water, a bit like beavers, they're like little micro beavers, they can plop back in. So they're all uh, making use of it? They're like a highway. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're yeah. all making use of it. Rats yeah. use them, otters, water vole beavers and beavers will use them to transport like bigger woody vegetation and now they've got all these canals coming out onto site um, so loads more habitat that they can occupy loads more access to food resources and um, it's kind of real credit to just natural process isn't it um, they create these habitats and we sit back and watch <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so and it's marvel fantastic. yeah and yeah, marvel yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah i mean it's all looking healthy and green again now but it's been a pretty dry summer hasn't it um, what impact did that have on the surroundings here? And also, I guess, how better prepared was this landscape as a result of having a beaver population? What's remarkable, isn't it, is that in the last kind of 100 to 400 years, we've lost 90% of our wetlands. And they're really important places and refuge for an awful lot of wildlife in drought conditions. But they're also buffers in a, in a, in a crispy, dry landscape. Now, some really interesting drone footage that was done by Clinton Devon Estate down in, in the lower part of the catchment showed their beaver wetland as this green, lush corridor through otherwise crispy brown grass. And what they've found is that it's kept that lush vegetation, it's supported some of the adjacent grassland, and it's kept the river corridor green. And the same is exactly true here. So when you look at this landscape from above, you've got this lovely green corridor moving through. And when you look at it in those drought conditions, you see the burnt off grass elsewhere in the, in the margins. So, it's certainly really important that we restore these wetlands and beavers offer us that opportunity to do so. From the air, the impact the beavers have had on this site is impressive. New pools and water channels on most of the land surrounding the river. However, it is also for this reason farmers worry about beavers arriving on their land. One of the things we really understand about beavers is the easiest way to reduce conflicts with them is to make space. So whether that means buffering rivers by 10 or 20 metres or creating whole corridors like we've got here at this site. Um, by doing that, you minimise a lot of the conflicts which might come from flooding agricultural land or putting burrows into banks and those burrows collapsing or feeding on crops. They really do stay near water. So by creating these river buffers, um, as corridors through our landscape, we can make space for beavers and loads of other really valuable wildlife as well. And what we're stood in now is probably where the old river channel would have meandered through, through the landscape. I suppose it's history of like how we've modified all our rivers. You know, we've drained them, we've dredged them, we've made them deeper, we've made them straighter, um, we've realigned them. What the beavers have done is try and revert it back to um, that wetland habitat that it was. Alongside this five-year trial, studies were carried out by the University of Exeter and the results were presented to the UK's Agriculture Ministry. 
It was then announced in 2020 that these beavers could stay as the only officially sanctioned population in England. Crucially, it was agreed that they would be able to expand their range naturally. This report was carried out by Professor Richard Brazier. I mean, the study you conducted um, has had quite a dramatic impact on this area, hasn't it? What, what, I think what did so. it find? What yeah, did you find? Yeah, nearly as dramatic as the animals themselves. Yeah. I mean, we, we studied lots of things. We studied the, the hydrology, so what the beaver dams do when, when rivers like this flood, or of course when we have droughts. We found that when the beavers build their dams, they slow the flow of the water and they store that water so it's gently released in dry times. So when it's flood time, the water flows more gently, but in times of drought, we get, we get more flow down the streams and rivers. That benefits the aquatic ecology because of course with more water, you get more life. And the dams also filter out any impurities, any pollutants from the water, so the water quality improves. And then the final area we studied was, what do people think, the social science? And we realized that actually, this renewed coexistence that is happening now between humans and, and this uh, animal that used to live in the UK, but not for a long time, is a really positive factor for lots and lots of different parts of society. Okay, because people understand and therefore don't fear in quite the same way. Yeah, once they've understood, uh, many of the fears go away. Once they realise that actually this animal was here and uh, interacting with the landscape for a long time before uh, we were, they realise, of course, that you know we're not going to see environmental problems. We're going to see more likely environmental solutions. Ironically, actually, to the problems that that we've caused, some of these flood-related problems, for example. A large part of the five-year trial was community education and local stakeholder involvement. So let's just talk about a little bit about where we are now. And we've got a river here, we've got a population centre here. Clearly they're prepared for the worst. Yeah, they're, they're concerned about the flooding. We've had very heavy rainfall after the recent drought and more thunderstorms, heavy rainfall forecast as well. So all of these houses that sit in the floodplain of the River Tail, yeah. they're prepared for especially the runoff and the big flows that are going to come down this tributary. Yeah. The beaver dams in the upstream and downstream of here of course, they're a more natural intervention. And interestingly, when we first started studying the beavers in the River Otter, there were no beaver dams at all. And we did sit down and say, what's going to happen on this scientific trial if they don't build any dams? But we were not disappointed. Within the first two years, they'd built nearly 80. And these are dams in small streams that push the water sideways into wet woodland, uh, into small floodplains storing millions and millions of litres of water. And of course, if that water is stored and held further up the catchment, it doesn't come onto the floodplain here where the houses are. And what we've realised with this animal is that, of course, it's possible to learn things from the beaver, to learn things from the way the beaver behaves, to learn that the stream edge and the river edge is actually a better place if allowed to be wild, a better place if allowed to store water there rather than, for example, to build homes or <laughs> businesses or roads on, because it is going to flood. And it will flood more under climate change, for sure. As part of the five-year study, they monitored the impact of beavers on Budley Brook. Six dams were built in the river, storing water on the land above a village that was flood-prone. Water level monitors recorded a reduced maximum flow after rainfall, the beaver dams in place, which would be beneficial for the village. These dams impounded 292 metres of the river and created 0.1 hectares of open water, in addition to other wetland habitats around the standing water. There's a quote on the Devon Wildlife Trust website which says that what's happened here is, I think it says something like, the most important intervention in British conservation history. Um, why is that? The beaver's the first native mammal to have been reintroduced to the UK ever. But I think that's one of the reasons it's so important as a sort of um, a milestone in conservation, really. And the other reason is that all the science and evidence that we did to build the case and show the examples of what it meant to renew our coexistence with this animal 
really told us uh, what a positive thing it was. So it's a, it's a kind of exemplar of how you should reintroduce the species if, if that's your business. After the original success of this trial, further legislation will now give protected status to these beavers and others from selected reintroduction projects across the country, as is in place in Scotland and other parts of Europe where the busy beaver is also enjoying a comeback. Projects like this that just say, well look, the land can be used for different things. We don't need to use every inch of this landscape for food production. Um, you know, we waste a third of the food we produce and much of this land is unproductive anyway. There's nothing really you can grow here that's going to produce much in the way um, you know, of, of, of sustenance for people. Farming here is barely viable anyway. After the original success with introducing beavers on his land, Derek Gow has since decided to convert his entire 300 acres, originally bought for conventional farming practices, into a centre for rewilding and conservation. Where did this journey towards what you're doing now begin? So this landscape that had once been full of all sorts of different creatures had become a landscape that was largely bland and dead. So I decided that what I was going to do with the land was give it a different future and that's what we're doing now. When you look at these creatures behaving in the way that nature meant them to behave, they are producing living space and giving living opportunities for other things. The buffalo coming. Hello. How close did you get to them? You get very close to them, but they are very bouncy. And bouncy <laughs> makes them dangerous. I don't know if I want to find out what bouncy means. You're a nice soul, but I'm just not going to stand between you and the Land Rover. So what we'll do is just go round the other side now, okay? Slowly. We'll just get back in the Land Rover, guys, now we can. I'm happy with slow. The team at Coombs Head aim to let the land recover to maximise the biodiversity and create a thriving nature reserve. Tay Davies is an ecologist and the site manager. Here we are trying to restore some kind of woodland to, to link the woodland over there to the woodland down here. Visitors can stay on site and take tours to spot the numerous species that have been introduced and also returning natives that have long since disappeared from these areas. This is an Iron Age pig? This is an Iron Age pig, yeah. She's a, a cross between a, a wild boar and a Tamworth pig and she's one of our agents of rewilding. So she comes through rootling up the ground, exposing bare earth, hopefully exposing old seed beds. She's very relaxed. Yeah. She's very relaxed. She's one of, she's one of the tamer ones. Um, if we had apples now, she'd be mad for it. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think she knows, well, she's kind of hanging around us because she thinks maybe. Oh, right, maybe we've got apples. Beavers, pigs and buffalo are one thing, but that's not all on Derek's rewilding agenda. So how do these creatures fit into the rewilding big picture? Um, so the thinking with lynx is, um, is based on what has happened in Yellowstone, where you've got a big apex predator back. In Yellowstone's case, it's wolves. And they change the behaviour of prey animals. They create what's called a landscape of fear. And they probably won't have a huge impact on the populations of deer, um, but what they have an impact on is the behaviour of deer. It allows for more re tree regeneration. So you said Britain's not ready to reintroduce these into the wild here yet. How far away are we from that? I mean, is it starting to become part of the discussion? It's, oh, it's, it's been part of the discussion for a, a number of years now. Um, so there, there are advocates of doing it now? There are a lot of advocates. Um, I'm personally probably an advocate of, uh, you could possibly get away with doing it now in these big wild spaces, they're not a risk. They're not gonna go for your kids or anything. They're gonna avoid you like the plague. And we can learn from the Europeans. The only reason we don't have these animals is because we have a bit of sea there. Um, in the Netherlands, they have wolves now um, because they've just wandered in and they have to learn to live with them. What we need is a, a bit of a, a drastic change in the, in the way that we think as a nation, um, the way that we live with nature. Throughout the tour, it becomes increasingly clear that the beavers are only one part of Derek's ambitious plans for this project and the surrounding areas. What would you like to see happening here in 
10 years, for example. In 10 years' time, I want to be standing in the middle of a scrub woodland with a few big animals moving through, but trees all around me. I want to be surrounded by birdsong. You know, I'd like to know that there are pine martens and wildcats living here as well, and that we see them regularly on camera traps. I'd like to, to be having a discussion about returning creatures like the wolf that's mature and grown up. I'd like there to be storks flying overhead and white-tailed eagles hunting them, and I don't think any of that's impossible, and that's what I intend to devote the rest of my life to doing. Are you optimistic? No. Am I optimistic? I'm realistic, and, 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 and realistically, the situation is not good, but I'll tell you this, every time you come out to this farm, you walk around this farm, you drive around this farm, and you see another flock of linnets, so year on year, you see the, the number of the, the stone chat families go up. You look at it and, and, and a tiny candle of joy reignites itself. These things would not have been here at all if we hadn't made the simple changes we've made. So I do think that as, as these changes accelerate, we acquire more land or persuade more of our neighbours to join this on this journey, that we will make a greater and greater difference. We are not going to save the planet by rewilding this one wee farm, but what we're going to sure as hell do is show a lot of other people who are interested in doing the same that it can be done. I think the really exciting thing about beavers is they give us the opportunity to look at the landscape differently. They ask the question, can we restore this landscape? And they start us on that journey.